Greeting citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful, creepy human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's true crime episode. I'm so happy that you're here. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this that we're forced to deal with on the day today, today you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Bratterstein, whichever you prefer, and today we're going to be discussing the murder of 44-year-old Hope Parks. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure Please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week, sometimes two a week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. All right, let's go ahead and get into this video. Now, this video is on a case that I learned about while researching another case, and this was a while ago now. It was about a year ago when I first heard of this case, and that was when, you know, things were just starting and a trial had been set, but I was kind of waiting to cover it until there was some sort of resolution because I wanted to see if more information would come out. And now that there has been some sort of resolution, I feel like now is the time for me to talk about it because it's one of those cases that just sat with me, you know? I feel like it's the type of case that didn't get the type of media coverage that I think it deserved and that perhaps it would have gotten if it happened in a different time because this happened in 2020 and there was a lot going on there as we know. And it just seems like people didn't talk about it very much and the victim hope sort of got lost in the mix because when I did research on this case in preparation for this video, I couldn't find a lot of information about her. And I think that that's a shame because the information I did find out about her let me know that she was a really good person who did not at all deserve what happened to her. So today I'm going to tell you the entire story. I read all the things so that you do not have to. And at the end of this video, I want you to answer the question of the day. I'm going to give it to you now so you can have it kicking around in your brain as we go through the details. But of course, I want you to answer once you have something to go on. But the question of the day is this. Do you believe that it is at all possible that what happened to Hope was an accident? Let me know all your thoughts in the comments below after we go through the details of this case. Now, with all of that said, Come gather around and let me tell you the story of the murder of Hope Parks. Our case today begins in the early morning hours of August 20th, 2020, and this is in a place called Crawfordsville, Indiana, which is about 50 miles away from Indianapolis. It's a city that's about 50 miles away from Indianapolis. It's on this day, this morning, that a man named Michael Dale Parks goes into the Crawfordsville police station to report his wife, Hope Parks, missing. He tells the officers that he and his wife had gotten into an argument about two days earlier and that she had left, that she had left her keys and gotten into the car, got into a car, which was either a white or a silver Honda Civic that was driven by somebody else. Somebody came and picked her up. She left and he'd been trying to get a hold of her, but hadn't been able to. So naturally a man in that position would be worried. So he's there, he's giving the, you know, the report to the police, the report to the police. Sure. He's giving the police the information of what happened and they're taking that information and they're getting all they can about his wife hope so that they can, you know, locate her. And one of the things that they wanted was like a description of her, which included the description of any sort of distinguishing marks like tattoos that she may have. And one of these things, one of these things that was specific to Hope was a tattoo of a heart with her husband Michael's name in it. And this tattoo ended up being super helpful for police in figuring out what happened to her because they had actually received another 911 call that day, a horrifying 911 call that very same day. So the other 911 call, it came in at just about, or just before rather, 5 a.m. when a woman was driving across Sugar Creek Bridge, which is a bridge a couple of miles outside of Crawfordsville. And it's a place that from what I can tell on Google, because obviously I don't live there, but from Google Maps, I was able to see that it's a place that's like, you know, nice looking. People go to walk, go hike, bring their dogs. It seems to be a place that people go to like get outdoors. So she's there. She's driving across this bridge when she sees something that no person should ever see. She sees a dead body. So immediately, obviously, she calls 911 and she tells the operator that she was driving on North 225 West Road and that she had seen a body hanging from the bridge with no head. With no head. So when she tells the operator this, the operator's like, uh, okay, like, are you okay? But by the time this question was asked to her, another person had shown up to that spot on the bridge. And we can hear this on the 911 call that another person pulls up to kind of see what's going on. Cause she sees that this woman's like pulled over and is on the phone, ETC, ETC. And that's when the first woman, which I didn't, there was nobody's name listed. So I'm just going to call first woman, second woman. The first woman tells the second woman that she's there because she had just found 
a dead body on the bridge. And the second person that showed up is like pretty casual. You can hear their voice and they're like, you must be mistaken. Like it must be a deer. And she's like, are you sure? Cause I don't think it's a deer. Cause I'm literally on the phone with 911 right now because I believe very, very much in my soul that that is a dead body. So the second girl's like, okay, just give me a second. I'm going to go back. I'm going to check and we'll see what the situation is. So she does just that. She goes back and she finds out very quickly that, oh shit, that's not a deer. That is an actual body. So she goes back to the first lady and now she's freaking out as well. And she's like, okay, you were right. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pull over and I'm going to wait here with you because both of them are just like, like, what would you do? What would you do in that situation that you're just driving across this bridge? It's early in the morning. You're probably going to work. It's like a work day. And this is what you're coming across. So they both wait for police to arrive. And all the while the operators just been listening to this interaction and it was recorded. And that's why I can now tell you about this interaction. Anyways, police were dispatched, right? And they get there just about 5 a.m. And when they get there, they find that, yes, it is true. There is a body hanging from the bridge. And when I first heard that 911 call, I was under the impression, or at least when I pictured this in my head, I pictured a body like hanging off the bridge by like a rope, right? Like that's what I pictured. I don't know about you, but that's not what the situation was. Basically, this body had been like stuffed through the guardrails so that the legs were hanging off the bridge, but the upper body sans head was still on the bridge kind of spread out. So in view of where, you know, people driving by could see. And when police got there, they could tell by looking at the body that it hadn't been there very long, maybe just a couple of hours. And later we find out that that is true or later, later they find out we're finding out now they find out later that this is true because they spoke to some witnesses um, and they were able to determine that she was likely put out there between 1 a.m. and 4.06 a.m., which is a broad time frame, but also 4.06 a.m. Did I say a.m. or p.m.? 4.06 a.m.? That's very specific. I don't know how they got that exactly, but that was the time frame they were, they were working with and it's five when they're finding her, so she hasn't been out there very long. So all of this is happening at the bridge. And remember, Michael Parks is at the police station reporting his wife missing, giving her description, telling them about that tattoo. So communication happens as, as it does, right? And they're able to, to, to determine that the body on the bridge has the same tattoo that Michael had described his wife as having. So they think it's very likely that this body on the bridge is that of Hope Parks, because who else could it be? Missing woman, same tattoo. And this bridge was only like two to three miles from the home that Michael and Hope shared. So it was all the puzzle pieces were fitting together pretty perfectly. So with that police tell Michael about the discovery they've made at the bridge and they tell him like, we can't say for sure this is her. We're going to have to confirm through DNA and fingerprints, things like that. But the body on the bridge had the same tattoo as your wife. So he is now under the impression that the person on the bridge is more than likely his wife, which like, damn. Anyways, police want to question him, obviously. And this questioning, which I was able to watch because there's this YouTube channel called Explore With Us, which is a great channel. You, I highly recommend it if you are interested in watching police interrogations, because that's how I was able to see this particular police interrogation. What was I saying? Oh, I watched Michael's police interview and it was very revealing. So from the very beginning, it didn't really seem like police were looking at Michael as a suspect. At least that's not the impression that I got from like the interview room that he was in because the interview room that he was in wasn't like the one that we typically see with the bright white walls that are closing in on you and the little table in the center. So you can't escape, you know, this one was a lot more cozy looking at like colorful walls or I can't remember. They might've been like blue. It wasn't as oppressive that couches, pictures on the walls, plants, shit like that. It was just like comfy looking. And it turns out that this was actually by design because this is called a soft interview room, which there's a soft and hard did not know that now I do. And a soft interview room is typically used for like victims or like kids so that they can be comfortable while they're speaking to a police officer or whoever's interviewing them at a time that it's gotta be a pretty traumatic time. If you're at the police station being questioned, right? Which if Michael, is being questioned after finding out that his wife's been killed and left without her head on a bridge. This totally checks that this is where he would be interviewed. So he's sitting there with the detective and the detective asks, asks him like, okay, what happened here? Like what happened? 
why is your wife missing etc etc and he tells them that he and his wife had gotten into an argument he had given her an ultimatum 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 and she had left so the specifics of this is basically that Michael and Hope had been fighting a lot recently. It wasn't just the day that she disappeared that they were fighting. They had been having a lot of arguments and the arguments seemed to stem from disagreements about how to handle their son. So they had an adult son and his name is John and he had a drug addiction problem. And because of this drug addiction, he had trouble holding down a job. He was living in the house with them and he wasn't contributing the way Michael thought that he should. So he already wanted him out of the house and there was already tension between him and Hope because of that. But things came to a head when shortly before this all happened, he came home and he found that John had brought drugs into the house. And that was it, that was the last straw, and he kicked John out of the house. Now, when he did this, Hope was very unhappy because apparently Hope and their son, John, were very close. The couple had two kids. They had a daughter named Katie, who I believe was older, and a son named John. And John and his mother, Hope, were super close, and Katie and her father, Michael, were super close. So because Hope had such a close relationship with her son, when her husband kicked her son out, when he's like in a bad space, she was very unhappy about this. She voiced this and this was making the two argue. But that wasn't the only issue when it came to John. Apparently the other issue is that, okay, John owned a car, but the car I believe had previously been owned by Hope, or at least it was in Hope's name, but it was owned by John. And Michael wanted Hope to like transfer the title so that it was in John's name and to stop paying for the insurance, like not have it all under her name. He wanted it to be his son's responsibility so that they didn't have to deal with any of that. Now he was adamant that she do this because apparently John had recently got a speeding ticket and because the car was like in her name and under her insurance, it was a problem for them. So he told her like, you need to transfer the title. You need to do this. So it's not our problem anymore. And she didn't do it. So this caused another fight. And ultimately Michael gave her an ultimatum. It was either going to be him or it was going to be her son, which I understand being mad. All of those things are reasonable reasons to be upset, but like that's not a reasonable request to make of a mother because I cannot imagine being put in that position between like your husband and your kid. That sounds like hell, but hope was. So this is what happened. He gave her an ultimatum. They fought. She threw her wedding ring at him and she left. Now he says Hope left with someone. He says he didn't, he saw the car that she got into, but he didn't see who was driving the car. He said that since she had left, he had been calling her, trying to get a hold of her, but she wasn't getting back to him at all. So that's why he came and reported her missing to the police. And the officer's like, okay, well, why did you report her missing? Because part of the story that he gave police was that he gave hope until Friday to make a decision to like choose between the two of them. And it was only Thursday. So why was he already reporting her missing? And why had he, you know, jumped the gun? Why was he worried that something could have happened to her? He responded saying that he wasn't really worried about her, but he had been getting in his head and he just wanted to make sure that she was okay. Cause they had been married like a super long time. And this was the longest he'd gone without hearing from her. Cause I guess the two got together super young. They'd been together 25 years at this point and they were both 44. Or so they got married pretty young. They had kids, they built a life together. So it seems pretty reasonable that a man may be in a state of unease when his wife of 25 years like ghosts him, right? But was Michael experiencing a sense of unease because he was worried about his wife or because he had done something wrong? Now, as I said before, Michael's interview was very revealing because Michael had this tendency to like word vomit on the detective. For example, the detective asked him a pretty simple question. Does your wife have any sort of drug issue? Which is a relevant question considering the fact that we know that her son had a drug issue and that she was very sympathetic towards her son. So maybe that's because she has some personal experience there. And he responds with, no, she doesn't. She's very controlling, which I guess you could make the argument that that does but that answer does apply and is relevant, right? Because a person that's very controlling over their own surroundings may want to have control of themselves and don't want to take drugs because then they would lose control of themselves, right? If that's what he meant, then sure, that could, I could make, make that make sense in my mind, right? But then he says that she's very controlling of everything and everyone else around her. 
So that's not what he meant. He meant that she's a controlling person, controlling over her family members. And then he says, but we've been together 25 years, so I'm used to it. And then adds that he has an anchor issue that takes medication for it. So the question is, does your wife have a drug problem? And his answer is, no, she's very controlling. We've been together 25 years, so I'm used to it. I get angry. I have to take medication for it, which is like a lot to say. It's a lot to say to that particular question. And he also added that though he had this anger issue and he took this medication, he had never hurt his wife before because of this anger issue. But he did admit that he wanted to hurt his son. And that's why he had kicked him out of the house so that he wouldn't hurt him. And I can only imagine that the officer in his head after hearing all this is like jotting down notes like, okay, thank you for all of your honesty, I guess, considering I did not ask. And Michael in his head is like, well, if you wanted honesty, that's all you had to say. Anyways, I got off on a little bit of a thing there. So police tell Michael during this interview that they would like permission to search his house and to search his car because they need to go through and see if they can find any evidence of where she may have gone or who she may have left with. Right. And police could get a warrant for this, like if they wanted to, but that would take time. So they decided to just ask him directly to see if he would give permission. And surprisingly he did. He's like, listen, I could go get my car and bring it over to you right now if you want. So with that, he puts into writing that officers are able to go and search his home, which was located at the 1000 block of South Elm street and gave them permission to search his car and other officers head over right away to, to start that search. And in the meantime, the detective that's questioning him gives him a break so that when they come back, when they get back together to continue speaking, he can talk with Michael about what may have been found during this search. And they were going to have some stuff to talk about, like the fact that there were, there was rather a little bit of a sign of a struggle in the kitchen. The house overall was tidy, but in the kitchen, there was like some hamburger meat on the floor that looked like it had gotten, you know, knocked off the stove during maybe a struggle. But besides that, one of the main things they found that was very concerning was blood. The blood was found in the house. They found it inside. They found it outside. There were smears and stains in the grass, the gravel on the patio, on the ramp leading up to the patio and blood leading to the basement. They even found bloody footprints in the garage, a shoe with treads that matched that footprint on the property, drag marks on the ground and a bullet casing in the grass. So with that discovery, they did get a search warrant so that they could search the house more thoroughly. And once they did, they found something incredibly incriminating in the couple's basement, but we will get there soon. Now, after that little search, the questioning resumes, but the officer doesn't jump right in to questioning him about what was found at the house. Instead, he asks Michael like, okay, is there anyone out there that you can think of that would want to hurt your wife? And Michael says, no, but then he smirks and he's like, but I do know that she really knows how to piss people off, which is like quite a thing to do the smirk and say those words. But the officer from there quickly switches things up. He's like, okay, cool. Cool. Yeah. She pisses people off. Um, why is there blood in your house though? Just, just out of curiosity, why is there blood all over your house? And in this moment, Michael's face changed. His eyes get bigger than I had seen in any other part of the interview, but he quickly recollects himself. And he's like, Oh, that must've been from me. And he shows the cop his leg and then shows him his finger and he showed him his middle finger and he actually flipped the cop off, which nobody acknowledged, but I saw, and he's like, it must've been me. I, you know, work in the garage. I cut myself up. I am a man who works on his bitch and truck men doing men things. And I bleed sometimes, but the cops are not buying it at this point. And they tell him like, okay, this is the time. Like we've been having fun. We've been talking. It's been nice. Now's the time where you need to be honest with us because something happened to your wife in your house. And the only person there with her was you. So you need to tell us what happened. And he responds was just like, I don't know what you want me to tell you. I didn't, I don't know what you're talking about. And he's like, I swear to God, I didn't hurt my wife. This is when the cop tells him, listen, we went through your house and we found everything. And Michael says, what's everything. And the cop says everything, the rest of her. 
And instead of Michael responding and being like, whoa, what the fuck? What are you talking about? What do you mean the rest of her? He responds with, quote, so what? To which, when I tell you, I paused the video at this point. I paused the interrogation. It was just like, sir, so what? You hear that cops found part of your wife's body in your house and you say, so what? And that's when the cops like her head, dude, we found her head because you remember the body that was left on the bridge didn't have a head. So when they searched his house, they found her head. And that's what they tell him. They say, this is what we found in your house. And you can tell in that moment when you're watching the interrogation that he knows he's fucked. Police had found Hope's head buried in the couple's basement. And once it was recovered, it was immediately clear why it had been removed. An autopsy later determined that she had been shot in the back of the head. She had also suffered blunt force trauma to her chest and her extremities before her husband had literally beheaded her with a mi meter saw, mitre saw, M-I-T-R-E saw, which I didn't know what that was. So I looked it up and it's just like an electric like table saw. So back at the house, you remember that police had found all that blood. Well, due to the amount of blood at the scene, they were able to basically like, well, not basically, they were able to actually follow a blood trail that led them down into the basement. And when they got down there, they found like drag marks. They found a little bit of dirt covering the floor. They also found bloody zip ties and small pieces of bloody plastic. And all the signs were pointing to this not being good. And they were right because in that basement below a giant pile of flex ducts, they found that there was a small shallow hole and inside the hole wrapped in several shopping bags, they found Hope's head inside that hole. They also found more trash bags, like not trash bags, like shopping bags, you know, like you go to Ralph's, you pay for a plastic bag. They found more bags like that, that contained bloody rags and hair. Which by the way, by using fingerprints, they were able to determine that the body that was at the bridge was that of hope. And by using dental records and photographs from the head that was found in the basement, photographs that were ID'd by her family, they were able to determine that the head in the basement was also that of hope. And when I tell you, when I read the part, that said that her family had to ID her by photos of her severed head. Holy hell. I cannot imagine what it would be like to view a person you loved in that condition. It is insane. This whole, this whole thing is insanity because everything I read, everything that I found said that hope was a good person, a sweet, fun, loving, kind hearted person person, full of love, a good daughter to her parents who fortunately, fortunately for them, they were both gone by the time this happened. And then she was a good mother to her two kids who became an obsessed grandmother, a woman who, in addition to raising kids and maintaining a household, held down a job at random house and made her coworkers days. She was the one who was always able to make them smile and laugh during their work days, whether it be from being a little slow on their daily walks or like the walks that they took during their breaks, or if she was just being a silly little jokester, cause she was said to just have a way of pulling a prank or making a joke that was unlike anyone else. And now she was gone and her family had to identify her by photos of her severed head. And to know that this happened at the hands of somebody who in her obituary was referred to as the love of her life. So back to the interrogation, the detective who was questioning Michael did what we sometimes see in these situations, which was he offered Michael an alternate theory about what may have happened that still put him at blame, but in a way that made him feel like less of a piece of shit basically for doing it. And the cop was like, listen, I know you're a good man. I know you work hard to provide for your family and your wife. She's just like a domineering, controlling woman and you snapped. It happens. But Michael, he's not budging. He's like, no, that's not what happened. Um, you might actually want to talk to my son you might actually want to talk to my son because he, you know, he knows some shady people. He's into some shady shit. And when I tell you, this reminded me so much of that case I did recently, uh, Michelle Williams. Was it Mich Williams? Michelle Williams, the lady who wanted to put suspicion on her own son to deflect from the fact that she murdered her husband. 
What a bitch move. Like the bitchiest bitch move. And the cop wasn't, wasn't buying it. They were like, mm, no, we, we know it was you. So it was at this point that Michael was like, okay, I guess this is what he said. He's like, I guess this is the part of the interrogation where I need an attorney, which you would think meant that they had to stop questioning him. But apparently I learned through watching this interrogation, that was not the case. They have to expressly ask for an attorney, not just be like, oh, I guess I need one. They need to ask for one in order for police to not question him anymore. So they were going to continue questioning him until he finally did ask for one. But it didn't take him long to end up asking for one because by this point, there were two detectives in the room until then, until now. There had just been the one detective doing the questioning, but now there was another detective and he's kind of off camera. And he's like, listen, we know it was you. You were the only one in the house. Your wife's head was literally removed in that house. So you need to tell us what the fuck you did. And it was at this point that he's like, I want a lawyer. And the questioning had to stop. So he was handcuffed. He was taken into custody and he was held without bail. And meanwhile, police continued their investigation. Now, the reaction from the community was just disbelief. They were shocked. They couldn't believe that they were living next door to somebody who was capable of that. And one woman said that it made her concerned. It made her concerned for her safety and for her kids' safety because this had happened like right by them. Somebody was, sh a gun was shot, somebody was killed, and they didn't hear anything. Another neighbor that lived just a few houses down said that he was very surprised to hear something like this happened, but at the same time believed that perhaps his wife had heard part of Hope's attack and murder. Reportedly, what happened is that this woman was out on her porch when she heard somebody yelling, quote, get off me, please let me go. To which I say, not to try to like say that these people are dicks, but if you hear something like that, like call the cops. You know what I mean? Like we, as a community of human beings, I don't want to speak for you, but I've seen in doing this, you know, doing this on the internet that so many people don't want to get involved, which I understand. Like if you don't want to get face to face with somebody, but if you're at a distance, you hear something, just call the cops. We ha we've got to just be better. But anyway, this man, this neighbor was like, what am I supposed to do? Like this happened 200 yards from my house where I live with my wife and my kids and they want to know what's going on. They want to know why all these cops are here and what happened and what am I supposed to tell them? How am I supposed to explain to them that our neighbor murdered his wife and cut her up? Which yeah, that's super messed up. That's super messed up that something like that happened so close to your home. It's even more messed up for Hope and Hope's family, but I do understand being like, what am I supposed to do? Because now they just have to sit there for hours and for days while police comb through that property for evidence, you know, bringing stuff in and out of the house, towing away cars. That has to feel very strange. But you know what? Police had to, right? Because even though they were pretty sure that Michael had done this, they needed to collect all the evidence they could in order to prove it and to disprove his story that it was an accident. So they're in the house, they're retrieving evidence and they get quite a bit. In addition to all of the other evidence that they had, which I already went over, all the blood stains all over the house, the drag marks, the head of the basement, they were also able to find um, 22 caliber, caliber? 22 caliber ammo that matched the shell casing that was found in the yard. They found a bloody blue tarp and get this. They found Hope's cell phone inside of a safe in the couple's bedroom. The same cell phone that he said he was calling over and over to try to find her after she left. They also learned through their investigation while Michael sat in jail that he had a history of domestic violence. Court records showed that about 20 years earlier, Michael had a prior conviction for domestic battery in which Hope was the victim. And yes, that was like 20 years ago, but it also showed that there were several other instances of domestic violence where things were reported and then dropped. So that doesn't look good. He seemed hella guilty, but at this point he wasn't ready to admit what he did. But he was ready to talk a bit. So four days after the initial interview with police, Michael surprised them by requesting to speak with detectives again, and this time without his attorney. I mean, last time was without his attorney too, but now at this point he had an attorney, but he wants to speak to them without said attorney. And he says that, you know, he just wants to tell them the truth. He started by going over his day, the day that Hope was killed, what happened. He said that he had been at work, that he got out of work earlier than usual, so he was home just a little bit after four. He said that the kids came over and hung out, which I don't know if he means his children or his grandchildren. I feel like because his kids are older, he might not refer to them as kids anymore, but that wasn't clear. And then he said after everybody left, he went out in the backyard to shoot 
groundhogs because apparently him and his neighbor had a groundhog problem which I know people hunt and shoot animals I'm not a big fan of it personally but this is what he was doing he says he was out in the yard and he shot three rounds into a tree to which I say do groundhogs hang out in trees remember I'm from Los Angeles I don't know shit about groundhogs I'm not an expert but the name would imply that they live in the ground if you know let me know he said after doing that, he went inside and he started to clean his gun at the table. He like set the gun down on the table, started to clean the gun when it accidentally went off because there was still one round in the gun. And at that time, Hope had been in the kitchen making dinner and all of a sudden she fell to the ground. And he said at that point, he just went into a panic. He had no idea what to do. He said he wrapped her up in a blue tarp. He drug her down into the basement. He cleaned up the scene. And from there, it was all a blur. And the cops did try to push him a little bit and try to question him on like, this is graphic and I'm, I'm not going to say the specifics, but like what it felt like and what the process was like to decapitate hope, like the skin and things like that. I think to try to shock him and things like that, shock him and things like that. I feel like I said things like that a lot. They tried to do that, but he just said, you know, he, he didn't remember that part. He says all he really remembers is crying and thinking about all the dumb arguments they had, all the fights they had about their son. And he said that he just thought to himself at that point that nobody would believe him. And they'd be right not to believe him. And police told him this because his story wasn't really lining up with the evidence because Hope had gunpowder residue around her wound, which would imply that at the farthest distance from the gun she could have been, it would have been four to five feet, which doesn't really line up with him accidentally shooting her from the kitchen table. In response to this, he just says, well, you know, I don't remember exactly like how far away she was. I just know that she was cooking dinner. And the cops were like, cool, cool. The problem with that is the farthest away she could be would be four to five feet to have gunpowder residue. But the medical examiner says that it was a contact wound, which means the gun was up against her skin when this happened. But they move past that and they ask him like, okay, has this particular gun just like gone off randomly before? Like, is this something that this gun does? And he says that he doesn't know, not to his knowledge, because it was a newer gun. He hadn't had it very long. And the officer's like, okay, would you consider yourself to have been being kind of like reckless? Was this a, he says it very casually, but like, would you consider this to be reckless? Because based on the, the angle of the shot and the trajectory, the gun would have had to have been like up in the air in order for, you know, the shot to have happened the way it did. And he said, you know what? Yes, I was being reckless. Now this was strategic. It seems random, but it was strategic because in Indiana at this time, I don't know if it's still this way. It wasn't that long ago. So it probably is still this way. Somebody can only be convicted of murder if the murder was, you know, done on purpose. And with the story he was giving him, giving them, the worst he could get would be reckless homicide. But the thing with that is it's kind of difficult to prosecute for because you have to prove that this person was being reckless and not just making a simple mistake. So now, even if they weren't able to get him on a murder conviction, they'd have a better chance of getting him on a reckless homicide conviction because of the things that he admitted to. But that wasn't what they were going for because they did still believe that he had murdered her. So they kept pushing him and they actually got him to admit that while he was, quote, you know, cleaning his gun, he and, oh, he and Hope, he and Hope had actually been arguing because first he said that they weren't arguing. Everything was peachy fucking keen and they were just hanging out. She's cooking dinner and there's a dog barking. She's cooking dinner and he's cleaning his gun. Now he's saying that they're arguing about John and they're arguing about the insurance issue and that she turned away from him to walk away. The cop tells him at this point, like, you've got to be honest here. You got to be honest with us. You need to be honest with yourself. You need to be honest for your son and for your daughter. And he says like, I don't know what to tell you. I don't have anything else to say. This is what I remember. This is what happened. And he said, anyways, I could never admit all of this to my son. I could never let him know that he is the reason this happened, that I shot his mother on accident while we were fighting about him. He says specifically of this quote, because that's the reason I pulled the trigger. And then there's a pause. And it's like his brain realized that that didn't sound right. And then he quickly added at the end, not intentionally. So now they had gotten him to say specifically that he pulled the trigger and not that the gun had just miraculously went off on its own. 
So Michael was sent back to jail where he would sit and wait for two years for trial to begin. He had pled not guilty and if he was convicted, he could get up to 65 years in prison and the max would be a $10,000 fine, but he could also get an additional five to 20 years for the use of the firearm during the murder. So during those two years that Michael sat in prison, the police continued investigating his case and they found much more evidence against him that completely showed that this was premeditated. Like the fact that, get this, Michael had been Googling some very interesting things in the time leading up to the murder, to which I say, keep Googling your murders, guys, because that is a genius thing to do. But he was Googling things like, do bottle silencers actually work? And do pillows actually muffle the sound of gunfire? Because you know how you see in movies that somebody puts a pillow and then shoots like in, um, stir of echoes, which I, that, I don't know if you've seen it, but in stir of echoes, they were going to shoot him. They put a pillow to his head and he's like, does that actually work? And why would he be searching that unless he was planning to actually shoot somebody and want it to be quiet? So police uncovering that him learning the police had uncovered that in addition to all the other evidence they had against him had to let him know, had to make him realize that his goose was effectively cooked and there was no way out of this for him. So Michael was scheduled to go to trial the second week of May in May of 2022. And just days before his trial was set to begin, he opted to waive a jury trial and meet specifically just with a judge to take a plea deal. Now, prior to the judge accepting the plea deal, he had, you know, like a meeting, not a meeting, but he met with, I guess it was still kind of a meeting. There was a hearing where the judge spoke to Michael and determined that he was okay to make this decision, like confirm that he was a high school graduate, that he understood what he was doing, that he didn't have any history of mental illness or drug use, all things that could make it so that he might not be in the right state of mind to make this decision for himself. And he confirmed that he was in the mind to make this decision. And he confirmed the manner in which he had killed his wife. And he wasn't very, you know, forthcoming with information. He was pretty tight lipped, just answering yes or no to questions, maybe because he was prideful or maybe just because he wanted to like not let his kids know what a fucking monster he was. With that, Michael Dale Parks pled guilty to the murder of his wife. And for this murder, he was given 50 years in prison. He would have to serve the entire 50 years. He would not be able to get a shorter sentence. And in taking this plea deal, he did waive his right to appeal. He was given the time served of 625 days that he had spent in jail awaiting trial. But I mean, He's 46 by the time he was sentenced. And so by the time he is 94, that's when he would be eligible for release in 2070, if he's even still alive then. I guess the minimum he could have gotten was 45 years and the max was 65. So after going through the mitigating factors, which were like him being a high school graduate with no history of mental illness or drug abuse, and the aggravated factors being like the premeditation, the mutilation of his wife's body, and the disposal of her body on a very public bridge, the judge decided the 50 years was appropriate. Which I don't know, I gotta be honest, I think that's kind of low because he murdered his wife. And not just that, for him to leave her on the bridge like that, like, why would he do that? Like, why would he leave her in such a public place? And some people there, I've seen, I've read some stuff, and some people think it was for embarrassment. I kind of, what I kind of think is that it was just, like, laziness that he got there, and it was harder for him to do than he thought, so he just, like, stopped and like left her, but we don't know. We'll never know. He didn't have to go to trial, right? So he didn't have to answer for himself. And to this day, we don't really know what happened that caused him to murder his wife. But I guess we did have the potential to find out once because, okay, you remember how I told you that I watched the interrogation video of Michael Parks on the YouTube channel, Explore With Us? Well, apparently when they made their video, they actually reached out to Michael. They reached out to him in jail to see if he'd like to go on the record, tell his side of the story, ETEC. E-T-C-E-T-C, -E -T -C, which would have been very interesting since he's never, you know, answered for himself or said out loud, like publicly what actually happened. But Michael did get back to them. And he said that he would be willing to speak to them if they met a couple of his demands. And these demands were as follows. For $300 to be put into his, the, the account commissary, commissary, the money, money for him to use in jail. And for this YouTube channel, whoever reached out to him specifically to send him a 36 inch or larger TV for him to have at the jail, because apparently they can have that in jail, which I did not know. Now the channel did decline. Okay. So they didn't get to have that interview. And now 
You know, we're at a point where we will never know unless he just randomly speaks to somebody one day. We'll never know why Michael Parks murdered his wife, removed her head and left her body on that bridge that day. And with that, that my friends is the story of the horrific murder of Hope Parks. I hope you found my telling of this to be informative. I hope it made sense. And of course, I just want to thank you for hanging out and remembering Hope with me today. Now, considering everything I told you throughout this video, I'd like to visit, revisit rather, the question of the day. And that was this. Do you think it's at all possible that Hope's murder was actually an accident? I've got to be honest. I do not. What I actually wonder is why he left her on the bridge the way that he did. Was it laziness? Was it to embarrass her? I don't see how you can do that to somebody, right? I don't see how you can do any of this to somebody you love. I just don't have it in me, thankfully. You know what I mean? Like, that's got to be shitty to be the type of person who could do something like this. But why did he leave her on the bridge like that? Let me know all your thoughts in the comments below because I, I, I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't know why people do the shit that they do. Anyways, guys, before you leave, please don't forget to leave me a comment down below with any cases you'd like to see me cover in the future. As you know, I have a long list of cases, which I'm always picking from when I'm picking a case. And I like looking into the cases you guys suggest. So whenever you leave me a comment with a case suggestion, I put it on my list so that if I do cover it, I can give you a shout out. I love looking into the cases you guys suggest because they're often cases I haven't heard of or cases that need more coverage. And I know you're filled with great ideas and great taste. Otherwise, you would not be here. If you haven't already, please don't forget to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell. I put out a new video every single week, sometimes two a week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us, one of us, one of us, one of us. And if you want to hang out more consistently, all my social media is listed down below, along with a link to my membership and a link to my merch store. And now with all of that said, I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That is tight. You are tight. Please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday. And I hope to see you in my next video. Bye.